isn't that a metaphor for contemporary life at the moment? So good morning, beautiful Melanie's back in a beautiful red purple Mel. <laughs> Oh, Thank you. That's gorgeous. Oh, I like that a lot. My, meanwhile, Leanne's altering her furniture. Thomas, mate, how are you? That bandana was a good choice, mate. Thank you. I'm <laughs> doing well. Now, how much power have you got? How are you going? I have power. I've had power for a week. I still don't have water. Oh, my God. So oh, hopefully God. by the end of the week, um, we shall see. Oh, wow. brother. We're, think, we're thinking of you, mate. We're absolutely thinking of you. Good energy, mate. And my my wife in a previous life, Karima, has joined us once more. Good morning, darling. Oh, I didn't realize I was not on mute yet. You heard me. You're never on. You're never on mute. No, oh, I just want to take ten seconds to say, Thomas, I felt so stupid last week about saying, "Oh, we're Canadian. We're used to the snow." What I meant is we have the infrastructure. You know what I mean? I didn't realize how bad things were when we spoke last week about what was going on in Texas. So no, oh, the, yeah, no. sorry if I, if I came across as completely insensitive. Look, oh, not at all. This look, is like no one's fault, but our government's right now. Yeah. And look, Thomas, what the, the point Kramer made is a great one in terms of infrastructure. I mean, you know, can you imagine Australia managing like a, a, a droplet of snow? And I know we've got beautiful Romy in from the United Kingdom. I know when there's a quarter of an inch of snow in London, the universe stops. Right. OK, like Heathrow and Gatwick have stopped. Am I right, Romy? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, Thomas, you're hanging in there. But Karima, Canada is built for it. Oh, I just got a nod. Thank you very much. So, Lauren, good morning. How are you, Lauren? Hi, Lauren. Have we got you? I'm not sure if I can mute or unmute her. So I'll just check who else we've got. We've got beautiful Lauren in. Hi, Lauren. Say hi if you can. Um, and we've got beautiful Annette in. Hello, Annette. Hi, Annette. We've got some people that may be on mute for me. Okay, Mitch. Hi there. Hi. Yep, I was muted. Oh, Annette, how are you? How are you, hi, Superstar? Yeah. yeah. Not too bad. The, your level of confidence frightens me somewhat there, Annette. <laughs> You okay? Yeah, yep, yeah, all good here, yep. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, look, colleagues, we'll, we'll make a start. We've got the dream team in once more. So as we always say, this is a, a relaxed and extraordinary environment. We've got some fun in store for us today. This is an interesting, different book, this one. Um, yes, look, thank you for that face, Leanne. That's helping us a lot. That's great. Uh, look, it's an interesting book. This one's a lot of nuggety complex ideas that we can really play with this week so let's go for it and as I always say we will commence with acknowledgement of country acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today elders past and present and any indigenous colleagues with us today and so team we've hit on being included published in 2012 by Duke University Press so we're continuing to move through the Ahmed canon and this is her most unusual book, I believe. This is the most unusual one in terms of methodology. We won't come back to this way of thinking again. So we may spend a bit of time talking about methodology. But this book is about, at its most basic, diversity practitioners in the United Kingdom and Australia in higher education. So Thomas and I have spent a lot of the last few weeks, haven't we, mate, talking about higher education and universities. And in many ways, this book grounds the conversation that we've been having, mate. So that's that's where we're at today. And look, let's start with Ahmed's key question, if we can. What does diversity do? And her question, what are we doing when we use the language of diversity? So look, Thomas, mate, I might start with you because how do you use diversity? And did Thomas, mate, your use of the word diversity change as you were engaging with this material? Where were you on the diversity arc, Thomas, mate? So I think uh, usually when I use the word diversity, it's within the context of my research. And so within sexuality and sexual behavior, you know, the more diversity I can bring into my sample, the better. 
then I can piece things apart and get a more holistic picture of what's going on. Um, but what really echoed with this book is my work on the COVID-19 shutdowns with graduate students, because there was a component where we asked in focus groups about Black Lives Matter and all of the social unrest in the country right now and kind of how that was getting, you know, conjuncted with the shutdowns and COVID anxiety. And I think the Ahmed argument was very much in line with what the grad students were saying, which was, we have diversity committees that don't do anything because they don't have money. They'll change the name of a building, but they won't change what's going on inside of the building. And so it was very, I was very familiar with this argument just kind of organically from the grad students' uh, interviews that I was already reading, um, which I fall in line with too. I think it's a uh, diversion tactic in a lot of cases. Uh, when an institution touts diversity, they're looking for money and they're looking to not change anything going on inside the buildings of the names they're changing. Huge. Do you read it? And again, uh, that's why I don't want to generalize any of our experiences. We've got colleagues from around the world on this call. The word diversity in the Australian context is a very soft word. And I'm not using soft probably pejoratively, although I may be. In your experience, obviously this is your research area in a lot of ways, Thomas, is it a soft word for you? You know, if we're dealing with difference, that's a bit of a harder word, or we're dealing with equality or social justice, there's a bit more of momentum and energy there. Is diversity a bit soft from your research, mate? I think it is, but also there's kind of a gatekeepy aspect of it too. So unless you meet the diversity requirement of either ideologically or embodying the diversity yourself, um, you're not really a part of the conversation yet. So you have to like meet that threshold and then have the conversation. Um, institutionally, it's very soft. Um, I think it's just kind of like a little check mark, like, oop, we're diverse. Um, one of the universities, which I won't name, mm. that I'm aware of is trying to become a uh, Hispanic serving institution. So they have to meet a certain threshold of Hispanic students here. And so they're putting a bunch of money into recruiting, but we have a, they have a giant backlog of Hispanic students who have been recruited, but can't make it into the institution yet. And so it's kind of like, you want this fancy title, but you're not actually taking care of the individuals, the diverse individuals inside of your institution in the first place. So it's both gatekeepy and aesthetic. And so it's soft and hard in a lot of ways. That's, that's huge. So you see diversity, and this is helping me, Thomas, enormously more. You've actually helped me more in the last two minutes than reading this book three times in the last week. <laughs> um, can I, you know, because that's what I expect of you, Thomas. Uh, so you see the diversity arc or trope as part of the higher education movement to mission statements, strategic goals. You see mm -hmm. it clustered in those sort of imperatives. Yes, yes. It's looking to make money while also maintaining the authority and power and institution that already exists. So like Ahmed was talking about, it diverts the conversation away from, you know, power and justice and, you know, actual like embodying the diversity that they're claiming to, you know, support to how can we get the stakeholder to give us money? How can we get the stakeholder to give us money? How do we get more students in? And they're not investigating what's going on inside. Like, I think that our, uh, wow. you know, our universities in America have become more diverse over time, but the graduation rates of people of color in our universities hasn't changed since the 70s. Yeah. So I don't know what we're doing besides, you know, using students as sources of income. Yeah. And Thomas, of course, I do a fair amount of work. My day job is, you know, as, as a dean of graduate research, right? And the tragedy of attrition, I mean, higher degree programs, the tragedy of attrition is a huge tragedy. It's even worse when we all take a breath and acknowledge that older students, women, citizens of colour, citizens with disabilities, they dominate the impairment information. Mm hmm now, so we've, we've opened our heart, opened our universities to enable the dreams of people, which is what a PhD program is, come in, you are part of us, and yet the attrition rates are higher for the diverse students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw a comment about the student loans. 
Yeah, so well done. So let's go. Do you want to take uh, – really, Thomas, you should be running this by – we've got about four weeks left, and, and Thomas can take over basically next week. You rock, mate. So the bandana, mate, holds the big brain in, I reckon. Yep, yep, um, got to keep it secure. <laughs> got to keep it secure. Look, I put your brain in lockdown, mate. It's, it's that precious. Melanie, let's talk a little bit about the student loan because I'm going to move to the workers themselves in a sec, but tell us, Mel, mate, about the, the student loan and student debt, which in the United States is crippling to people's lives. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking as he was talking about, you know, we're recruiting more diverse classes, but then the, the, the graduation rates aren't going up. But that means if a student's not graduating in the United States, they probably have oodles of student loan debt. And so they, they come out of college with the debt, but not with the degree that is supposed to um, lead to higher incomes to enable them to pay off that debt and so then you know you're you're recruiting um you know a more diverse pool into this place of privilege um but then it actually for some people sets them back even further than they wouldn't have been if they hadn't dared to dream to go to college um because you know some institutions i mean some institutions do a really great job and have lots of support um you know, for students um, to help ensure retention rates and graduation rates, but other institutions um, don't. And I think those are probably the same institutions that feel forced into the strategy or of like Thomas was saying of like trying to recruit um, and generate the money, you know, the, those places that are really worried about um, numbers of students in terms of like, as a revenue stream um, are also the places that probably don't have um, the steady financials to provide that kind of like support for students to help ensure retention and graduation rates. And, and probably, and I'm about to move Leanne to talk about the workforce, but you're right, Mel. So we haven't as a university done the very hard work we need to do to just use indigeneity as an example, to decolonize the doctorate, right? So we've just gone, right, well, why haven't we got any indigenous PhD students? And we haven't actually <laughs> done the hard yak that's required. What's going on with colonizing knowledge systems in our universities that we have for generations upon generations upon generations failed indigenous students and indigenous communities. And now we're sitting back wondering why indigenous students aren't coming into a PhD program. And that that would be it. I saw Le Leanne McRae. Leanne, should we talk about diversity workers, which is quite ironic considering the work I did this morning. Uh, diversity and equality practitioners working in universities. That's what Ahmed described as her project in this book. Now, who are these people? And, I don't know. And, and what are they doing in higher education? Is their role representational mate or is there a you know what is the work of these workers what what work are these workers doing Leanne? Well I'm confused I, I don't actually know I I'm very confused about a diversity worker and what that means is it somebody who sits on a committee because they have a particular embodiment and therefore they are representative of the diverse face of the university and if they are sitting on this committee in that particular embodiment, mm. what does that mean? How are they interacting? What, how are their voices being enacted, enabled? And how does that speak for whoever they're supposed to represent? Yes. I don't, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question because no. I don't. I don't know what a diversity worker is, and I, and and I think that it has partly to do with the the question you started with with Thomas. This idea of diversity being a soft word, so it does become representational. And as we had the conversation a few weeks ago about representation being very both important but also quite vacant in many ways. Um, that it's this, this double-edged sword. And I feel this is the same about the word diversity. I think diversity is a word that has two functions. It, and both in, in, when I'm in my good mood, it's function. Place. When I'm in a happy place and I'm feeling good, diversity is about casting the net wide, 
about acknowledging that there are so many different experiences, so many different identities, so many different ways of being, knowing and understanding the world and that we should not have the arrogance of presuming, you know, other people's experiences. So we cast the net wide. We go diversity. We try to be inclusive with that word. Yes. But when I'm cranky, which is most of the time, um, I tend to think it's just a way of not upsetting white heteronormative people, that you can use the word diversity without anybody actually interrogating what that means and without actually having to shift any position, which is exactly with Thomas, uh, Thomas's argument that he made before, that the institution doesn't actually have to change anything. They can just simply craft an image around that term that sits within their equity outlook and that excellence is reserved for that traditional group that is seen to be already excellent whatever that means yes. in the past it was a very elite you know narrow version of the populace yep. um, whereas our uh, university is fulfilling some sort of ideal of community interaction community outreach equity like we have to be sharing with our knowledge, sharing with our, our spaces of understanding. And I think diversity is a way of dovetailing into that trajectory. And I don't know if it means anything other than recruiting different types of people to sit on committees. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a very um, tenuous thing, I think. I think it's a, I think it's a very. It's not structural. No, it's not. It's like, yeah, it's like you can put a body in a seat in a chair somewhere, but whether their voice is enacted and enabled in a particular way. And that she talks about that. What does it do? What happens to the document once it actually leaves the committee or whoever's put this policy together? You know, what does it do? Universities are filled with unread mission statements. Yes. And I think that's to do with, again, this way of di di this term diversity not uh, being very conflicted, being very vacant in many ways. Absolutely agree. And Leanne, I'm, I'm going to go to, to wonderful Romy. Good evening, Romy. 11.30 at night, I know for you. And look, when I was writing my notes, Romy, I picked up that issue to the problem with the word representation. It has many issues, theoretically, politically, socially. But one of them is it leads to this representational load issue, which has been the big phrase really in the last two, three years, Romy as you know yeah. so so there's the issue of okay so the university has managed to hire some black or brown staff students citizens of color and and therefore the burden the representational burden of institutional change then goes on those crew so Romy would you like to talk about that because this this phrase representational load has started to be thrown around in the last couple of years and again without content would you like to speak to that mate um, I, I will do. I want to also address the question of what of, of Ahmed not defining diversity workers because she does, and I'll put the quote in mm. from her blog. And I think her blog is often a place to check her most up to date thinking. Mm. Um, excuse of me if I haven't put quotation mark, but it's. Okay, so she says, being a diversity practitioner means you are in effect appointed by an employer to transform form the employer. It is a difficult position. Mm. One practitioner described the job as, quote, banging your head against the brick wall job, unquote. Yes. Even if you are appointed by an institution to transform the institution, it does not mean the institution is willing to be transformed. In fact, many practitioners encounter resistance to their work. Diversity is work because of that resistance yeah. you have to find ways um let me go back you have to find ways sorry i found lost my place you have to find ways to get through because you are blocked this is why i call diversity workers institutional plumbers they have to work out where the blockage is or what stops something for example a new policy from moving through the system 
So I think it's a really clear definition and I think she's working through things. I actually take issue with the notion that it's an, a, a position that's emptied of meaning. Mm -hmm. I think there are very many definitions of that term uh, diversity. For those of us who have experienced particularly I would say anti-black racism in the UK, I would say that it's a word that we hold on to as hope and it is not emptied of meaning at all because it's the, the very kind of tenet by which we fight the injustice that I think, you know, within HE, and I speak what I know, which is in the UK, and I speak about a PhD experience that has been arduous mm -hmm. in the UK because of discrimination, I would say that it's the the academic institutions in this country some of them are some of the um they are bastions of colonialism it is it, you know you use the phrase before about um the the colon decolonizing the academy i mean i i think that it's often uh the case that there are you know you scratch a liberal <laughs> you find something else is going on and so i would say in my own work I often write about, um, inspired by Ahmed, um, diversity as window dressing. Um, it's very much used as a kind of frontispiece to fend off attack and critique. It's disingenuous from the point of view often of senior management systems, higher echelons, you know, the numbers of directorates that I've experienced that are all white or, and, or they have no interest in embracing diversity because it would mean change, because it would mean then giving up power, it would mean vacating the throne, it would mean relinquishing, it would mean really having to address the structural issues and there's no investment really in wanting to make that change. So in those contexts I think diversity therefore becomes, um, yeah, window dressing is the best phrase I can reach for, it's there just to show what we can do to tick the box, we have nice certificates, we have chancellors of the academy who hold the certificate and say oh look we've got these points but actually I think um, I speak of a kind of case that I know at one university of somebody who'd experienced relentless discrimination and actually he ended up uh, deciding to take up a diversity post within that same institution so he could make the change that he did not experience when he was doing this other post so it wasn't emptied of meaning for him and he was a figurehead for me to be able to direct black students I knew who were experiencing discrimination because of the research he was conducting. Now, some people resent that. They resent the idea of an expectation that because they are a particular thing, they should conduct certain types of work. Some people decide, you know what, this is where I'm gonna place my energy because if I'm gonna see any change, then I have to do it from the inside. And so Romney beautifully said, beautifully said, the idea of investing the word with meaning, though, that it is, if you like, an empty signifier that is then filled with meaning by a courageous individual. I've always said, Romney, well, I've yeah. 20 years or so, <laughs> that yeah. one has to be very confident in one's power to give some away. And that's why yeah. I've always argued that, say, Altoro New Zealand has managed colonization. I've used the word manage, not address, but manage colonization so much more effectively than in Australia. And of course, when I, when I was in England for oh, 10 years as a, as a professor, uh, the, the first statement that was made to me was, oh, you're an Australian. Uh, I've never met an Australian that doesn't work behind a bar. Um, and, you know, I was a full professor at the time. So the only question I want to ask you that really did disturb me, and please critique my methodology on this, Romy, please, is the nature of a comparative study, which is what this book was, and it was the United Kingdom and Australia. Were you somewhat concerned in epistemological terms that there was a, a reification of all citizens of colour? So the experience of Indigenous Australians, for example, is very distinctive from the, you know, the history of black British Liverpool, right? They're very different. And so the notion that they are reified or simplified into a diversity word and in terms of methodology in, in this book, it, did it simplify what actually are radically different histories? But I think that that's not new. I mean, 
that's not new in terms of civil rights. I think that quite often umbrella terms are used to uh, unify people who have a common or shared experience of trauma about something, even though actually there is diversity under the umbrella. And I think that, um, but it's important to acknowledge the umbrella. And I think that that's what happens in the use of the term black, for instance. There's huge heterogeneity when we think about blackness. It's not a monolithic thing, but I think what it is, this, it, well, it's, it's uh, about politicizing blackness and that for therefore it means that we often focus on our similarities rather than our differences. And I think that when we're further along in an argument or a fight, then we can focus on heterogeneity much more. But I think people at the first instance feel a need to hold on to the unifying factors. Does I that address what you're... Yeah, it does, I suppose. I mean, I still am, am, am very un uncomfortable by that, maybe because I've done the work on colonisation in these different environments and certainly living in, in the United Kingdom as I did and the complete disconnection from a diversity of colonising histories from co formerly colonised nations. Uh, that always did concern me a little bit and bringing forward the diversity of Sri Lanka to Bangladesh, to India, to Pakistan, to actually allow those diverse and very complicated histories to be told rather than black and brown Britons. That's always concerned me. I, I mean, I, again, I don't, I, that's not my experience. And I do think those galvanizing systems are really important in terms of movements and a sense of global movement. I mean, when we talk about say Black Lives Matter, there's huge heterogeneity in people who are kind of followers of that, but actually it's important in terms of mobilization to see that commonality yes. um, and, and, and then um, uh, create action based on it. I mean, that's the, yeah, I, I, yeah. Can I also suggest to you in terms of just that whole word diversity and the discussion we're having now, I really urge you to be looking at the work of Amanda Parker, Inc. Arts and the work she's doing in terms of Black Zoom. Yes. what I call Black Zoom, which is the use of online digital spaces that our Black people get together, particularly in the creative arts, which is my oh, absolutely. sector. Absolutely, and the, the disintermediated yeah. project there is incredibly powerful, and I'm absolutely in favour of that. Well, the reason why I mentioned Amanda Parker in Encarts is because she writes a lot and talks a lot about diversity. And so it's a contestation of any idea that the notion of diversity is emptied of meaning. It's, I mean, her big uh, project at the moment is to get BAME off the agenda. BAME over is um, one of the campaigns that she's involved yes. with. But she talks a lot about diversity and she, um, her work is all action based. And just some of the stuff that I have encountered both personally and professionally that she's doing I think is extraordinary so oh, absolutely, if you want absolutely. a UK oh absolutely and yeah. what I'd say what Romy is we know that every word that is used is deployed in different ways and reclaimed and reused that's that's the nature of, of epistemology in this book though Ahmed does focus on the problems with the word yeah so I suppose that that's where a lot of the conversation did start. Obviously, it's been you know, this was 2012. That's a decade ago. It's a long time ago, and a lot's happened in those debates since then. But you you rock superstar. And Amira, my darling, would you you've done a wonderful comment there. Thank you, Romy. Um, Amira, would you like to say hi to everybody? Uh, sound, my darling. Yeah. Um, hi everyone. Thank you for um, welcoming into welcoming me into this space. Um, I'm really looking forward to engaging with you all and listening to your thoughts. Um, I just had a quick comment, um, uh, just sort of off the back of what Romy had said as well, um, and also off the back of what you were just saying as well, Tara, around the reclaiming of language. Um, and my experience, sort of, in the UK higher education system is often a commodification. Um, of these terms, diversity, inclusion, representation, even equality, um, and taking it one step further, what I've noticed over the past couple of years is sort of a hijacking and to a certain extent, a, a bastardization of words such as colonialism and um, decolonizing uh, equity even, and, and what the true meaning of these words are and how they're enacted in these spaces. Um, for me personally, a lot of the rhetoric in the UK around, around the moment um, and sort of speaking to Sarah Ahmed, Ahmed's work around the um, what we were just 
talking about earlier as well around the, the progression and the, um, the progression and the retention of black and brown people within higher education mm-hmm. and this notion of sort of, of a broken pipeline and sort of where I stand at the moment with things is that the pipeline isn't broken, the system is not broken. Um, it's actually functioning at, as it's supposed to be. This is how it was designed to function. And so as a, as a black woman in British academia and British higher education, we are not, the, the, the pipeline isn't broken for us. We are anomalies in the pipeline. We are not supposed to be here. And that is um, that is highlighted in our experiences, in our outcomes, in, in the amount of money that we make, um, in how we're able to sort of navigate internationally in every single avenue um, and dimension, it, it highlights itself. So I think we need to move away from the rhetoric of a broken pipeline. The pipeline isn't broken, it's working. It's working perfectly and amazingly for a lot of people. It's just where we're not the people that, are suppo- that it was designed for in mind. So Amira, I would like to be you and I agree with you so expansively, I cannot even speak the words. I believe that the university sector, the higher education sector is working exactly as people want it to work. It intentionally excludes colleagues with disabilities. It doesn't want women to get PhDs. It doesn't want crew of color. It doesn't want indigenous crew. It likes to party on your yeah, Doe. So your point about uh, the commodification is so powerful, my head just exploded. Can, can you and I, because you, you seem a, a very robust human being. Can you and I have a conversation about racism Let's do it. Let's do it. Now, Ahmed uses the great statement, to account for racism is to offer a different account of the world, end of quote. Now, I like that. I think that's interesting. Now, what does success look like if we actually and properly address racism in our universities? So I'm aware you're anti-racism, all these words have a lot of volatility around them as wonderful Romy has made very, very clear. But if we are successful in somehow managing an anti-racist project in our universities, what does success look like, Amira? What does success look like? How do we know our anti-racist struggles are working? I guess my question would be, how do you manage an anti-racist project in an institutionally racist environment? Yes. Um, I don't know if it's possible. I would maybe even verge towards it's not possible in the current manufacturing and layout of of the system. Um, It would require a dismantling of a lot of and an undoing of a lot of work um, that I don't know if it, I don't know if it is possible. Um, Yeah, which is, it's sad and it's slightly hopeless, (laughs) Um, but uh, I think it would be, I don't know, let let me, let me hear what you think of of that, but that was sort of my initial thought is, I I don't know. Outstanding. Can can I ask a question for you? I, I suppose part of it is a representational politics question too, Amira. Would it make any difference if and when we start to get a large number of vice chancellors of colour um, in formerly colonised nations and indeed in the United Kingdom. So does that representational strategy, is that part of our way forward? So when we start seeing black vice chancellors, indigenous vice chancellors, brown vice chancellors, does it make, would that make a difference to you? Would it matter? Uh, On the surface, yes, I suppose, but I think there is a lot of holes in the politics of representation. Um, And there are a lot of, um, you know, just even France, you know, black, white masks, black faces and having people of color and black and brown faces in high places does not necessarily translate to changes in the lived experiences of people. Um, So the issue of tokenism uh, and and having people of color at the top of oppressive systems, uh, of of inequitable systems and and the reality of that. Um, And even if we move away from our education systems in the UK at the moment, if we even look at people in government are a lot of black and brown faces and why is it that you have these black and brown faces um, that are arguably wearing the masks of white supremacy um, and and you know enacting policies that are so harmful to people that look like them to people that come from where they come from um, and do it with such sort of 
a blanket brazenness and hubris. Um, there's something to that. So the politics of representation is is one thing. In the UK, our figures, particularly for black, in the whole of the UK, there are only 35 black female professors. That's three five. So when when you think of sort of what are the chances of the politics of representation um and what do you have to give up as well morally ethically to get to these to these spaces and who in the words of you know dr cornell west there's no point being a spectacle at the top if you can't bring people with you um so looking at the at the venture of that and a quote that i often come back to is um james baldwin's i don't believe what they say because i see what they do and so even seeing people of color at the top i see what they do and so having black pro vice chancellors i don't i'm i'm not i'm not i'm not sold on the idea that that is the golden ticket um, amira i'd like to invite you down to be our vice chancellor to be frank but uh, <laughs> um amira maybe there's a lesson we can learn from feminism here because i suppose most of us had great hopes that you know once the woman uh was was appointed that it would it would be transformative to the feminist project and of course as i'm sure i'm not speaking out of school most of us know probably the worst bosses i've ever had in 30 years of working in uh higher education the worst bosses you know the bosses that people have suicided under their leadership have all been women now again that's not about representation there's nothing about having a vagina that's created bad leadership but there is something about what people have had to perhaps manage on the way up that's configured that particular modality of leadership, perhaps. Yeah, our pain is not less because the person who's enacting it is somebody who we can share similarities with on the surface. It doesn't, uh, in in many ways, that sort of, that's a, a symbolic violence and you realize that that is manufactured, their positioning as well. There it is, symbolic violence. We're there. Amira, wow, it was worth you being part of our story today. You've just changed my life in the last 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, you are an absolute legend. So you took it, you took those debates with great complexity. Wonderful. Romy has changed our life already. Look, I'm going to go to Karima and I'm going to you intentionally for a multimodal conversation, Karima. And this is going to be really uncomfortable. You ready to get really uncomfortable with me? You ready? <laughs> Well, I guess I can always just end the meeting if I have to. Well, that's right. You can just, you can just do a, oh, man. It's, I just it's know. You. Um, look, and I particularly want to talk with you about this one because Canada's so complex in terms of the history of diversity. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Multi multiculturalism is part of the national project. Uh, it's taught, it exists. You think it is the most multicultural, the policy in many ways started there, and it moves through all the systems and the structures. But, you know, you live, it, no. I live there. there. There's a brittleness to it. Is, have I been unfair there? No, I just said, does it really move through all the systems and structures or is it just another, you know, what's, is, is the word macrocosm a word or is only microcosm a word? Because it's, it's, it's the same, it's, the same um, yeah. it's very much the same institutional, or sorry, the, the, the concept of blockages and, and, and lip service. It's a top down, and, policy. top down policy and it's in effect and diversity washing because sorry I've interrupted you I'm no, you're now not. making you uncomfortable <laughs> no you're making me so comfortable I'm nearly asleep Karima it's unbelievable Karima Dunn so therefore in terms of the Canadian example I would like to talk about whiteness and remembering the wonderful commentary that Romy's given us about her imperative that there is value political value in dealing with the, the, the unity in the diversity, right? So therefore, let's go to whiteness. Let's go to whiteness. Now, the great quote, whiteness tends to be visible to those who do not inhabit it, end of quote. Tremendous. Now, is there value? And Leanne knows exactly where I'm going. Is there value, Karima, in talking about the distinctive history of whiteness? Now, I've often, you know, I've been doing work Earth. for 25 years. So in other words, actually marking the unmarked sign, talking about what whiteness does as a project. And the hardest bit of the question, and this is what I've been sitting with for the last week, is the phrase white privilege, which again, I believe it, you know, it can be used and should be used and gets people thinking. But I wonder if, if using white privilege, if that's the phrase that enables consciousness and an exploration of whiteness, or if that is becoming a blockage. Where are you on this, Karima? Hard question. Hard. Lots job. of. Well, you had so many questions there. Um, 
I think that the word white privilege works for some people, mostly people who have had it explained to them and unpacked and who have probably been educated. And I think for them or from it could work and it does work for some people, but I think it also in um, more, I don't know what the sort of the general population, you know, it's something I can see in my own family and my own peer group that is a, as a defense, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's uh, exactly what Amir was saying, or maybe it was Thomas, or maybe it was Leanne, or maybe it was Rami, sorry, about, you know, people don't want to give up what they have, right? And the project of whiteness and the, the you know, and just reading Ahmed's books have given me a little bit more background on how much whiteness does and how much, um, you know, and I just, your first comment about the quote about not, whiteness is not a shark, it's the water. Yeah, I've heard that before, but I need, could someone explain that to me, what that means exactly? Um, Amira, do you want to potty, Amira, want to potty on? Because then we might talk about water too. So Amira, do you want to just provide a bit of juice around that and we'll come back to Karima. Go Amira, come on. It's about the norm, right? The whiteness as the norm? Exactly, yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off, Karima. Um, yeah, no, that's didn't. a quote, okay, perfect. That's, um, that's a quote from a American, poet, activist, writer, um, and, he, and he, I really like that metaphor and analogy, he talks about how whiteness or white supremacy isn't the shark, it's the water, yeah. and I think that is a good visualization for people as to how it is the norm, and it is the right. sort of the ideal for, um, it sort of, whiteness has not been seen as a race, but as the architect of the human race, and how everything else uh, derives from that or differs from it. Um, and sort of that being the gold standard and the ideal. And then what does that mean for spaces of education, where then that is the norm and the ideal for research and pedagogy um, and, and output. And so then how do these spaces, if that is the water, how do we how yeah. do we move in the water, in, the, in these waters? Can you, can you change an entire ocean? But can you study the water? Can you actually see the water? See right. it yes. and work with it. So ignore the bloody shark and actually go, let's study the water. Yeah. Yes, I think that's important and holds value, which was your first question, right? Should we, yeah, I think that's a no brainer because you know, maybe there's drops that can be put into the water that will make the whole ocean turn a color and we'll all see it. Do you know what I mean? Like we don't know what this, strategies necessarily could be for um, making visible the taken for granted white structure system. Absolutely. I don't know. I just find it so fascinating, like, you know, just to be as a person, I consider myself white, but I'm half Arabic. I have a, an Arabic name. And I went to Queen's University in Canada. I don't know if anybody knows about Queen's, but I it is like does. white. I've, I've never, it was like what she described as walking into a sea of whiteness for me as a person who is white, you know, and pretty white. It was unbelievably striking. And the amount of anti-black racism towards the few professors, the few students who, who are on that Queens campus, this was 10 years ago, I doubt anything has changed if anything, if probably has gotten worse, yeah. was, you know, in the newspaper, you know, that's how bad it was. So, you know, it became visible to me when I stepped onto that campus and, and I've been on plenty of campuses in my life, but there was, there was a Scottish history on Queens. It's the Canadian pinnacle, sort of our, our most elitist university and they've got the bagpipes and they wear the tams and it's just all the all the girls look the same they wear the same uniform it's not a uniform it's just like a it's, it's an unfortunate fashion selection. pardon it's an unfortunate fashion selection it was just i just the point was like i noticed the sea of whiteness and i wasn't even I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have stood out and it was striking to me. So it was just a glimpse of what that, you know, experience would feel like to anyways, I've said enough. But is that also because race is a classed category? Um, is that well in this yes, I think it is. 
I think Sorry. intersectionality, your, 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 your point about uh, white privilege, you know, I think people who are upset by the term white privilege don't understand the intersectionality uh, piece that that allows them to understand that, that they have problems too, you know, and that they yeah. may be affected structurally in different ways, you know, because it's kind of trying to get, it's kind of a conversation shut down for people often. Agreed. And of course, this is the first book where we see intersectionality mentioned. So we're seeing it from 2012. This is where that conversation starts. Magnificently done, my queen. Beautifully said. Oh. There's a lot going on there. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm going to go hard at this point. So we, we always knew today it was going to be a very, very difficult conversation. Leanne, I want to go into complicity. Mm. I want to go into complicity. Now, whiteness can be a situation we have or are in. Quote, complicity. Now, are we all complicit? Yes. What do we do with it? What do we do with it? What are we going to do about it? Do we just go, oh, we're all complicit? Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, that's, that's, the, that's the question, isn't it? Yes, we are all complicit. We are all involved in it. And I think this is the, the moment that is so much, is the, is the point of discomfort for so many people, is whether they're willing to recognise or deny their complicity within this system. And to acknowledge your complicity does, is actually the, the point of actually stepping out of it, of, of, of having a moment. But people see that as a a lot of people see that as a moment of um you know admitting something about yourself that's unattractive that's that's um not nice but as as, as amira has so eloquently demonstrated to us this is this is an infrastructural thing now that doesn't absolve individuals from their responsibility uh, within that, in to say, oh, well, I can't do anything about it, so whatever. Um, I think it's that, that very moment of acknowledging your complicity that you begin to shift the terms that you use, the way in which you interact with people, you start to seek out. I think that, you know, and she talks about that in the book, that the, the the moment of acknowledgement of complicity, the moments of acknowledgement of uh, these, the discomforting moments. And I think, you know, in terms of our discussion about white privilege, it's, it's I have some reservations with the term, obviously, um, a lot of reservations with it, um, but it's also the reason it enacts so much anger, I think, is because it, force is trying to force people to sit within their discomfort and I don't know whether that's a good thing I don't think you should perhaps you should force anybody to do it um I don't know it doesn't, that. Create, it doesn't create consciousness no, no I don't think it does I think it, I think that's the point I think it I think it is is because it's discomforting people shut down from it yes and when you confront people in that way, you know, you actually create a, a resistance. You create a barrier. People get defensive. And, and it, you know, and this is something about the, you know, the, the representational load, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that people of colour, people of diversity have to take on this emotional labour of gently nurturing somebody through this discomfort. You know, the they, sad white person is like, let's, yeah. let's go through it again. Yes, and it's like, you know, this, you know, that person has lived with tremendous amounts every, of discomfort every, every single day, and they, they have to kind of put that on pause and go, well, you know, so you don't treat me like crap, let's talk about this, and let me nurture you and help you through this. And so this, but that is also part of, white privilege that privilege of not having to do the labor yes the the refusal of doing yes. heavy lifting is also white privilege all yes. of and i listened to yesterday the the obama bruce springsteen series of potties and oh. of course they would do the you know basically two hours of of these two talking about racism and what I noted in, in that conversation, and you know, racism in the United States, and what I noted about that conversation is the, they were very gentle with each other. There were lots of silences. The conversation was slow. 
as each side was trying to find the perfect and accurate word to insert in the conversation. So it was, it was slow and considered and careful and asking questions and creating listening spaces. And, and I thought as I was listening to that podcast, that's exactly the model that we require in the rest of life. Uh, it, it's the, the importance of being careful and listening and working with the spaces and, and not expecting answers. And that's how people can be in discomfort. It's like acknowledging, I know you're uncomfortable. That's okay. That's cool. Let's just sit there. Now, let's talk about why you are uncomfortable in a way that's safe and there's no right and wrong answers. If something weird happens, we're cool with it. But how few spaces exist in life for that, Leanne? Oh, very few, I think. And I think because there seemed to be a burden on who does the listening. Mm. And I think, and, that, and that's also a part of an infrastructural network of being in the present, of not acknowledging past and not acknowledging futures even, that, you know, that this moment here and now doesn't involve a heritage of disempowerment, doesn't involve a heritage of, of colonial crap, doesn't, you know, doesn't acknowledge sexism, doesn't acknowledge any of those, these things. I'm just a person here right now, which can be incredib incredibly powerful, but also when you deny that narrative of how you move through space and time, um, that places a burden of listening upon you. And I, I love how listening is a burden too. What a powerful phrase you've chosen there. So it's about well, think, recalibrating think, listening cultures too, isn't it? Well, yeah, I think I think there is a I think listening is a burden. I think there is it can also be incredibly liberating, but I think it's a moment of burden. What I mean by burden is taking stock of yourself. It's about that burden of you. Like who are you right now? Who, who are you going to be? Are you going to be the person who listens? You don't have to agree. You don't have to take it on. But are you going to listen? Yeah, and that's a here. Listen. Yeah. Oh, wow. Look, my head's just exploded again. You guys do this to me every week. L Lizzie, can you just talk us through to carry that point home about sitting with discomfort? I think that's amazing. Lizzie, can you speak to that for us? Have we got you, Lizzie? Don, I think your, your mic's off, sweetness. Do you want to just say hi? Hi, Lizzie. I'll just read <laughs> Lizzie's point, if I can, if she, if she would like to have a go. The notion of sitting with discomfort. So using wonderful Romy's point there too, Leanne, while we're sitting in discomfort now, that's significant that actually there's a digital component to this as well, that the nature of digitization requires that spaces are filled. Everything is happening at speed and is being occupied. This is giving spaces is very different, isn't it, Leanne? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think um, I've written a little bit about the hashtag yeah. and the importance of the hashtag in both opening and closing spaces. Yes. Or for these practices to happen. And I'm not idealizing the hashtag. There are tremendous problems with that as well. Yes. Tremendous difficulties about it, but there's something about the circulation and the movement of ideas in the digital space that can be both hijacked by a variety of forces, mm. but you know, can also, as, as, as um, Romy talked about before, about the digital spaces can also um, you know, provide both the acceleration and the hesitation to prov to create these gaps of, of intervention and intersection. Nice. Nice. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. And look, as we always do every week, we probably should finish with Queen Alyssa. And I know this has been worrying Alyssa for the week, and we talked about it on Sunday morning, Alyssa, because we did want to talk about the interviews. So, colleagues, this book is different for Ahmed. 
Uh, she works most frequently in the high humanities in high theory. Here we're operating in more of what we would call the applied social sciences. So there is a methodological transformation there. So I know Alyssa and I, we were talking a lot about the interviews. There were 21 interviews done, 10 in Australia, 11 in the United Kingdom, and the project was meant to be a national comparison. That's how it was configured. So Alyssa, what's happening here? What's your feeling about the methodological changes of this book and again Ahmed um, described the experience of conducting the interviews was quite nerve-wracking as a text-based researcher by training so do you want to talk us as we finish our gig today Alyssa about the interviews and the movement to more applied social sciences oh uh, okay I don't know if I really felt a big difference with this book uh because it felt to me, as though the interviews were very much used to prove what she wanted to say rather than being... So it, it felt like they were part of her argument rather than getting to stand for themselves and, and kind of actually have a voice within it. Interesting. Um, I, I kind of found it a bit methodological lacking. Um, I thought it could have been a lot clearer in that I understand you have to preserve anonymity when you're doing stuff like this but there really wasn't a lot of breakdown of who she spoke to um and I thought there could have been more of an interesting discussion around her position with those interviews because she acknowledged that it was difficult coming from text-based backgrounds than doing interviews um and I think there's that kind of inside outside of dichotomy and kind of like She's there as an interviewer, but she's there as a um, mm. someone in a similar position, and how that kind of facilitates discussion. Um, yeah, so I just I felt like a lot of it was kind of just shoehorned in there. So, and, Alyssa, therefore, how? Because obviously, you you've got incredibly rich data to, data sets to be using in your PhD. You have the best data set ever in the history of, of gaming and popular culture that you've collected. You might like to say to people the scale and scope of the diversity that you've got. What have you learned about the presentation of the people who have given you the privilege of their time and their voice and, and how you manage that in your own research? How has that transformed you and your engagement with literature, Alyssa? Um, well, I think in the the past, I've kind of thought of integrating quotes the way I kind of would from articles where such and such said this, and this means that. And so you're kind of contextualizing it yourself and you're putting this meaning like sandwich with the quote. So you're not really letting it speak. So I'm kind of trying to think of how I can put quotes in there so that if someone reads them and they don't agree with me, and how I've read it, there's still room for that kind of interpretation. And I see a mirror nodding straight at you there. Very, very powerful. Because that's, of course, the challenge, isn't it? Because you, you want to protect the diversity of the people that you've interviewed and acknowledge their journey, their narratives, give them space mm -hmm. in your research. Yeah. And, and there's an ethics matter involved in that conversation too isn't there really so do you want to just by the way say how many people you've got the testimony of so for my main survey i got like forty six thousand responses um so there's a few um and obviously i can't choose everything um but i really appreciate the time that people spent filling out the survey because i got quite a lot of very long responses um and i think for my non-player survey because i interviewed players of DD and non-players i was really surprised by the amount of non-players i got and that kind of generosity of information and i don't want to do a disservice to kind of what i've been been given essentially and i think if i try to push a narrative of my own using those quotes that's kind of it's almost dishonest maybe very powerful and then of course that changes the form and content of research because all of us have to work harder so in some ways we were always magically going to get, end up here with this stunningly complicated intricate and delicate book in terms of form and content it is provocative in the best sense and if it asks us and questions in us 
how we use the testimony, the voices and the views of others, then my goodness me, it's done an astonishing research service. So can I thank you all? I've had one of the best hours I've had in my life uh, in the last hour. And I thank all our wonderful colleagues that have joined us in the middle of the night. Um, our amazing colleagues that are late in the afternoon. Look at Alyssa, she's as impressed as I am. It is a powerful conversation and you have reminded me uh, what a university can be if we all just work a lot harder and building on a mirror statement, if we actually just basically raise the thing to the ground and work out how we can do it better for the next generation. And you all seriously deserve that. Thank you for your time. Much love. See you soon. Thank you all. Bless you. Come back next week, everyone. See you. See you, gorgeous. See ya. See ya. You were brilliant. See you, my darling.